Hamilton County, Public Health, you guys know where Hamilton County is? That's Cincinnati. So I work for Hamilton County Public Health, and I'm originally from Cincinnati. So, you know, we have an interest in making sure that the community is protected and from a multitude, from a lot of different uh, uh, challenges. And that's our job as the health department. So with that, I mean, how does this work? Do you want to start asking questions and then I start answering or how you want it to work? I just keep talking? We can start with, um, what, are some, what are some things you've seen in Columbus, some challenges? All right, so in Columbus, you know, how does Columbus, what, Columbus compares to different cities in, in, a, in a number of different ways. Um, a lot of times with big cities, then public health challenges and environmental health challenges are the same. And they're unique to bigger cities. That's for a number of reasons. What's one reason why, this is going to be interactive, so you guys are going to have to answer questions too. What's one reason why a big city, why, why the environment or public health would differ in a big city versus a small city, or like a, like a farm area? Go ahead. There's a lot more people. Absolutely. What else? Go ahead. A lot more pollution. A lot more pollution. You guys are going to have to follow me around a little bit, so I'm going to get on the board, okay? There are three things that determine health. And these three things are true no matter what issue we're talking about. Whoops. One is population. The more people you have, the more public health problems you're going to have to try to deal with. You said the other one. Pollution. And we've already talked about how these two things, how they tie together. Why? why? Why is this? Why do you have more pollution if you have more population? That's true. That's absolutely true. Why? Go ahead. More cars running. What else? How do you, if you have more population, you have more what? Trash. You got more trash? Sure. Perfect. What's another big one? Factories. You got factories. Why do you have more factories? Because more jobs, right? So you got more jobs because all this population has to work, right? And then how do you, how are the lights coming on today? Electricity. electricity. How do you make electricity? You got burn coal, right? There's other ways to do it too, but we'll talk about burning coal as the primary way. So you've got more power plants. That's perfect. What a great segue. What's the, it's the, we call it the three P's of health determinants. What's the last P? We, we've kind of set it up a little bit, I think. Melissa has set this up a little bit with you guys. What's the last P when we talk about health determinants? We've got population, we've got pollution, and we've got poverty. Poverty. And we, you know, we, you can say poverty, and that's very true. We, we call it, we have a fancy word for it. It's called socioeconomic status, but we'll call it poverty. But socioeconomic status. So those things are tried and true as the three determinants of health, no matter what issue we're talking about. No matter if we're talking about <coughs> rates of smoking or tobacco use, whether we're talking about rates of cancer, whether we're talking about rates of illness, that all plays a role in these three things. So, with that, what is Columbus Public Health? Well, Columbus Public Health is the local health agency that helps prevent health outcomes related to these three things. Okay? Now we do that in a variety of ways. Now I work in what's called environmental health. And environmental health is defined as, this will erase, right? Environmental health is the protection of people. Well, let me ask you this. When I say environmental health, what do you think of? When I say environmental health, go ahead. 
outside plants, trees. Okay, good. So environmental. I'll call it EH. You guys cool with that? EH, environmental health? All right. So we got trees, plants. What else do you think about when you think about the environmental health? Air. Air, okay. Yeah, air. Why are we worried about the air? Because if it's polluted, people will die. Okay, so so because the, there's pollution in the air, but why do I? Why do you think I care that there's pollution in the air? What are you doing every breathing. second? You're breathing, right? You can't stop breathing. You can, but I wouldn't recommend it. So you got to keep breathing. <laughs> so you have people that you have to breathe. Well, with this issue with the trees and the plants, what environmental health is defined as, and there's a difference between environmental health and kind of environmentalism. Now, you've heard from some environmentalists, and it all ties together. You protect the environment, you are going to protect health. But environmental health is defined as the protection of people. So you, me, our parents, our brothers, our sisters, the protection of people from biological, chemical, and physical hazards in their environment. So think of environmental health at, when you think of the environment, you really think about grass and trees and pollution, and that all plays a role in it. But when we're talking about the environment, I'm talking about this room we're sitting in, the restaurant you eat at, the grocery store you shop at, the pool you swim in in the summertime, the house you live in. That's what environmental health does. So, I'm getting to a point, I promise. So, with environmental health, the things that we do in the health department in environmental health is we do things like restaurant inspections. You guys knew that already, right? Mm -hmm. so we do restaurant inspections, okay? Here's something else we do. We inspect swimming pools. You guys knew that? Yeah. Okay. We inspect the landfills. Why do we worry about the landfills? Sorry. That's where all the that's where all the trash is going, right? We got to make sure that it's being being done right. So we do landfills. Something else we do is we make sure that houses are safe from lead. Who knows what lead is? Metal. Lead. Lead? It's a metal, right? Where do you find lead in a house? From what? Pipes. Yes. What's the I'm gonna, it's over there. What's the elemental symbol for lead? I can't see that far, I just know it. What's the elemental symbol for lead? Think about peanut butter. PB. You'll always remember lead as PB if you think about peanut butter. So we do lead, and it's in the pipes. Where else is it? Paint. Paint, yeah. So paint. So we have, we have people to make sure that houses are safe from lead, okay? <clears throat> so there's a lot of other programs that health department does. These are a lot of the big ones that environmental health does. We do things like immunizations. You have to get your shots. You go to the doctor. You go to the clinic. You get your shots. You get your immunizations. Who got a flu shot this year? All right. I got sick with the flu anyway, so it didn't matter, but that's okay. It's a story for another day. We'll come back and talk to you guys later about that. Um, we do things like um, we, we analyze data to see about health outcomes. We're going to talk about health outcomes here briefly, okay? Um, we do things like prepare for emergencies. Were you guys even alive when, in 2001? Okay. I'm getting really, really old. You guys remember 9-11? Maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. That was a big thing, and now there's a lot of, we get a lot of resources to help try to prepare for things like that to happen again. And some of that comes through the health department. We also investigate illnesses. So if somebody comes down sick with salmonella or with anything like that, any bacterial illness, we investigate to see where they may have gotten exposed to that. Because we want to make sure other people don't get sick off of the same thing. Okay? So that's kind of what, so in a nutshell, what does Columbus Public Health do? We protect health. And we improve lives. 
That is our mantra. That is what we do. Phil, we protect health and we improve lives. And we do that through everything that we've just talked about from an environmental health standpoint. So, the reason we the, the reason that I came here today was to talk about the environment, talk about chemicals, okay? And talk about how we interact with that. But before we do that, we've got to have an understanding of, of chemicals versus pollution. They're different, and we've got to understand that. And we'll make sure, let's walk through this a little bit. So, what's an example of a chemical? I'm getting like 10 answers. What'd you say, man? Acid? Sure. So, a chemical is acid. Do you think we need acid? Where do we, how do we use acid? Or sure, there's natural acid, right? Mother Nature makes acid for us. Our, our bodies make acid, right? When we talk about all an acid is, is something that, I don't know if you guys have learned about pH yet, but in science class, but all acid is is something that's not the same pH as water. So it's, and it can, it can be dangerous, yes. Is it natural? Sure it is. So acids are natural to some extent. What else? What about man-made acids? What, I mean, citric, yeah, orange juice, that's great. And our stomachs make acid. What else? How did you get here today? A car or a bus, right? right. What do you think starts that car or bus up? Gas. A bet, well, no, well, gas too, but a battery. Yeah. And they have to have acid in the battery to make sure the batteries work. So we got batteries. What other kind of chemicals are out there? So we got acid, and there's there's a million different kinds of acid out there. What else? What's another chemical? Bleach. Bleach. What do you use bleach for? Wash clothes. Do they put bleach in swimming pools to make sure they're safe? No. They absolutely do. The swimming pools. It's got a hole in it. It helps to disinfect. It helps to make sure bacteria, it kills bacteria. Now, what I will say about any, one of the principles of, of chemicals is that everything is toxic. Everything on this earth is toxic. It just depends on the dose. So what do I mean by dose? How much you take. How much you take, how much you're taking in, right? How you're taking it in your body. So to that extent, you know, if you're asking yourself, well, Luke, then if everything is toxic, then what about water? You think water could be toxic? Mm -hmm. At the right dose, what happens if you take too, if you drink too much water? Yeah. You drown. Nowhere for the water to go. It goes into your lungs and you drown. When you, you know, and that's what, part of what prevent that too when we go out and do swimming pool inspections. What about things like Tylenol? Tylenol is good, right? You have a headache, you take Tylenol, it makes your head feel better, okay? What happens if you take too much Tylenol? You can, you can get really sick. So my point is, in all this, everything, no matter what chemical we're talking about, everything is toxic in this, and it, some things are more toxic than others. But everything is toxic. It just depends on how much you're going to take in and how you're going to take it into your body. So that's chemicals. So really anything is a chemical, right? I mean, if it, you know, water to a certain extent is a compound or a chemical. That's natural. But water's like that as well. So we have there's some use for most of the chemicals we have on this earth. There's a good use for them. We need acid, we need bleach, we need water, we need Tylenol. We don't need Tylenol, but we like to have Tylenol. So what about, so how does it become pollution? How do you go from chemical to pollution? How do you go from chemical to pollution? Well, first of all, how do you pol what is pollution? When it gets exposed. Okay. So expose. What else? What is pollution? It gets into the air. So we got air pollution. Where else can you pollute something? Water. Water. And again, why are we worried about air pollution? Because you breathe. Why are we worried about water pollution? Because you drink water. So that's why we're worried about it. You can also pollute on just the land. I mean, go down the street and see how much kind of litter you see. Now, is that kind of pollution that we're really, really worried about? No, but 
Litter is pollution just the same, just a different kind of pollution. Um, well, how does it get from chemical to pollution? How does it get there? Okay, because chemicals pollute. Really, what it boils down to is how are we getting rid of the chemicals that we don't need anymore? We should be using machines. You should not be using the creek. Who said creek? Someone say creek? No, don't say creek. I'm sorry, I thought I heard from a creek. You should not be using the creek. <laughs> so there's ways to use the chemicals and to not necessarily have them pollute. Would you be surprised if I told you that that factories are allowed to pollute? Would that surprise you if I told you that? That the eat? Go ahead. What do we find out about proscolite? That they're allowed to pollute. Yeah, a certain amount. Did it surprise you to hear how much they were allowed to pollute? I didn't know so much. It's it's a lot. I mean, these places are allowed to pollute a lot. Now, why is that? Well, I think it's around, and I'm not the EPA, but I think it's around that we need those things. We need those things that are being produced. We need electricity. We need stuff. And with that comes pollution. But what did, what did you also learn about what they do to try to prevent the amount of pollution? What do they do? They put limits on it, and they put all kinds of fancy stuff in their factory to make sure that, yes, they're polluting, but they're polluting as little as they possibly can. And that's what the EPA is here for, to make sure that they're following what they said they were going to do. So with that, that, I just wanted to kind of talk about chemicals versus pollution and make sure that we had a clear understanding that, yes, chemicals are necessary, Chemicals, without chemicals, everything in this room wouldn't have been built, okay? It can lead to pollution, but if it's done right, it doesn't have to. So, with that, <coughs> I still haven't talked about what we do, what public health does to help interact in this process. Well, I said that our job, part of it, is to prevent people from getting sick from chemicals. And... We do that through a couple different means. One is, how many of you guys drink water at home? I do too. <clears throat> a lot of times we turn our water on. Do you ever think about where the water's coming from? Do you? That's interesting. That's great. Most people just turn it on and take a shower and do the laundry and they don't worry about where it's coming from. Now, for the most part, in, in cities like Columbus or Cleveland or Cincinnati, water comes from a what they call a, a, a municipal water plant, where there's a big plant and they have a process to treat the water for all kinds of stuff, bacteria, chemicals. Um, and the EPA is the one that, that oversees that process. But what we do is if there is an area of town that doesn't have access to public water, we oversee how the well, they used to use a well to, drink, to pull drinking water from the ground. And we oversee that process, and part of that is testing the water to make sure it's not exposed to chemicals or contaminants. So that's how we interact with drinking water. Um, as far as the chemicals themselves are concerned, we have a program that will go into factories and will examine what they... Factories have an obligation to, bless you, factories have an obligation to report their chemicals they're using to us. Because the community has a right to know what chemicals are in their community. And I'm sure you probably learned about some of this already. It's called Community Right to Know. It was a law that was passed almost 30 years ago where, where every person in this room, every person in this community has a right to know exactly what chemicals are being used and what isn't being used. And we have a person that oversees that information. And then we'll go out to facilities that, that, that harbor, not harbor, that, that use pretty nasty stuff as part of their process and make sure it's being stored right and make sure that they've kept it 
safe and make sure that they're not, it's not a matter of making sure they're not polluting because we don't get involved in that. That's the EPA. It's a matter of going out and making sure that they're saying what, whatever they said they had, they actually have. Um, part of what else I wanted to talk about, and then I'll let you guys, I want you guys to ask tons of questions. Please ask me any question you want to ask me about anything we do. Um, and I got some gross stories too. You want to hear gross stories later on. But um, the other thing we do is look at what's a health, let me ask you, what's a health outcome? What am I talking about? Go ahead. Something that happens based on An outcome? Absolutely. Related to your health, right? So something that happens based on something related to your health. What's an example of a health outcome? We talked about a couple already. What about cancer? You think cancer is a health outcome? What about heart disease? Health outcome? Asthma, health outcome, absolutely. And we do stuff with asthma too, I forgot to mention that. Um, those are all health outcomes. Now, when I talk about, hey, let's talk about air pollution. What do you think is a possible health outcome of air pollution? You just mentioned one, say it again, asthma. What's another one? What's another one? What about lung cancer? You think you can get lung cancer from being exposed to air pollution? Sure. Now, a lot of times we like, in, in our society and in, our, in my job really, we like to find what we call the smoking gun. We like to find what exactly is causing somebody's health outcome. If you have salmonella, I want to know, I, my job is to try to find out exactly how you got that and what food you got that from. What's the, what do you think the problem is with trying to do that air pollution to asthma, air pollution to lung cancer? What, how else, I guess, another way to ask my question is, how else can you get lung cancer? Smoking is the big one, right? Sometimes where you work can give you lung cancer, depending on what kind of things you're working around. Now, we talked about pollution, poverty, and overpopulation. Would it surprise, would it surprise any of you to say that there are studies to say that poverty leads to higher smoking rates? That, poverty, that, that, that it's shown that, that poverty leads to higher smoking rates. So the problem is, <clears throat> there's a lot of different things that may cause asthma, genetics, how, you know, your genes, how you're born, lung cancer, same thing. And it's really, really hard to find what we call a smoking gun with air pollution in relation to any of these kind of health outcomes. A lot of times air pollution can be linked to heart disease or diabetes. Go ahead. Birth defects, sure, sure. Birth defects. Absolutely. <clears throat> and with any of these, and especially with like heart disease and diabetes, it's really, really hard to link it back to actual pollution because there are so many different things that cause heart disease, cancer, diabetes, your diet, the house you live in, other things like that. Now, sometimes we can have a better smoking gun when there's clusters of what we call clusters or a lot of people in the same kind of general area that have the same health outcome. So if everybody in a neighborhood has cancer, or if a lot of people, if more people than normal have cancer in a neighborhood, it kind of helps us look into that a little further to say what may be going on in that community that is leading to that. But again, the problem, it's not, well, it's a problem if you get sick from anything, but when you look at how people die now, 
would, would they die of things like cancer, heart disease, stroke? So we're all so it's hard to, to match things up because we're all dying. Essentially, we're at some point we're all dying of the same things. So it's hard to pinpoint to say yes. In that area, there is a high. I mean, we know there's higher rates of cancers, heart disease, high blood pressure in certain areas of town. But it's very, very challenging to then link that back to well, it's because of this, or it's because of this factor, it's because of because there's so many things that cause any number of these kind of health outcomes. So, with that. The birth defects is a, and again, the unfortunate part of any of this is that we do this after people get sick. It's hard to, our job is to prevention, is to prevent people from getting sick, protecting health, right? That's the mantra. It's, it's really hard to do that when we can't get kind of our head around why, why people are getting sick, which is part of the challenge of what the health department does. So with that, I've talked everybody to boredom I'm sure so what I want to hear from you guys you know what have you talk about what you've learned with this with this project and talk about talk about how you think you can have an impact on on changing things that's the key what is the most important um, what's most important about your job What's most important about my job? What a great question. I think the most important part of my job is, is really protecting health. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing, is protecting health. And how do we do that? Well, we do that through making sure that we are doing the work around inspections, doing the work around community. Um, I think really the job, and this is really with any job, it's about creating relationships with people. Because when you do that, it, you know, it, it turns into less, being less about me being the health department guy with the badge shutting the place down. So that's, not, that's not good. If I'm shutting a restaurant down, that's not good. If I'm shutting Plasco Light down, that's not good. People lose jobs. I mean, it's not good. Um, if I can create relationships and have them kind of, what I'll say, buy into my message, buy into public health, and buy into community, um, I've won. So I think the most important part of the job is really around protecting health, improving lives. But moreover, it's about it's about creating and maintaining relationships with people. And what you'll find is that's. That's life. I mean, that's any job is about creating relationships. It's about telling stories. Um, that's what's important in, in not just public health, but in any job or any, anything, any aspect of your life that's about doing those things. Great question. Is that no? Okay. Well, what else? Who? Yes. Great question. Let's talk about this. This is good. Do you guys know how water gets, that how they get pollution out of water? You guys have, well, let's, let's walk through this real quick. Because that's a great question. And th I'm not an artist, so you'll have to excuse my lack of art ability. So water goes in, and there's a bunch of sticks and logs, and I mean, it comes in from like a river or a reservoir, in the case of Columbus, comes in in a reservoir. So they have a screen here. Think about like a screen door at your house. They got all the sticks and logs and everything else. Well, then they have big tanks. And again, this is not to scale, obviously. They have big tanks where let the water sit. And they add chemicals to it. They do add chemicals to it. They get, they want, they want to create, there's a bunch of small things in the water that they want to have them combined together. So essentially they put, some, it's not glue, but it, 
acts like glue and it makes these, these smaller particles come together and then they call them settling tanks. So in the settling tanks, the water settles, right? And all this stuff settles to the bottom of the water. <clears throat> then it goes through and now it gets filtered. So now they've, they've screened it, they've settled it, now they filter it. What do, they, what do you think they filter it with? Clean. They use sand. Just plain old sand, plain old beach sand. What it does is it helps get rid of some of the bacteria and the viruses in the water. Now they got to get rid of the chemicals. Now they got rid of the bacteria and viruses. Now how do now they get rid of the chemicals by running it over? You ever you ever, you ever grill at home, charcoal grill? Yeah. Well, guess what they do to get rid of chemicals? They put they essentially put charcoal in it. Is all they do, and it absorbs all the chemicals that are in the water. Now after they do that, they add more chemicals in. Wait a minute, they just got rid of all the chemicals. What do they got to put in the water now? They got to they got they got to, they got to sanitize the water. So what do they use? It's on the, the periodic table over there. You put it in swimming pools. You do it in your laundry. They bleach. They put bleach. Put plain old bleach. Put bleach in the water. Then they add something else. They add fluoride to the water. Now why do they add fluoride to the water? Teeth, because they show that fluoride is good for your teeth. Now I haven't had fluoride in a long time. So when you get to be a grown up, you don't get fluoride. But you know they give it to you when you're when you're younger, to help make your teeth strong, okay? And then get and then guess where it goes, your faucet. So that's the process. So to answer your question, yes, how do they, how do they, why do they put more chemicals in after they try to take all the pollutants out? Well, they put more chemicals in because they don't want people getting sick. So. Is there a risk that they put too much chemical in? Sure, sure. But they've got fancy machines, and they've got people like the EPA to make sure that, that they don't. And city, I can tell you, City of Columbus does the best job I've ever seen about making sure their water supply is safe. I've never seen a, I've never seen a city do the kind of things the city does to make sure that the water, when it comes out of, into your tap, is clean and healthy and good to use. Because we, we at Health Department, we promote water drinking. We want you drinking water, not pop and not juice. Water, we want to drink water first. So we got to make sure it's healthy and safe. That's a great question. I have a question with the, yeah. the water. Do you have a question? Okay. okay. <laughs> Two, one, would you say it's better than to drink bottled water? And then the other one is, I got a little pamphlet, I think, from you guys mm -hmm. in my mail about lead in the water from mm -hmm. the pipe. So mm -hmm. even though you've done all this cleaning process, mm -hmm. my neighborhood has older pipes, sure. so then it collects the lead from the pipes when it goes to my mm -hmm. house. So how can you maybe we talk on either sure. one? Sure. Yep. Um, so I'll talk about the first, the last one first. So somebody already said it earlier. How do you how do you get why are we worried about lead? Well, it's in the pipes because the pipes are old. And before, right before I was born, is when they realized that lead's not good, that lead's a problem. Now we just kind of take it for granted that lead, we don't want to be exposed to lead. But before 1978, they thought it was the best thing since sliced bread. It was good for your pipes. What they found is it makes you sick if you get too much of it, so it makes you sick. So what I can say is a lot of times what they'll tell you to do, because they can't go in and replace all of these pipes that have lead in it. They can't do it. Now, the pipes in your home should be copper. They should be copper pipes. You should not have any lead lines. But the lines, there's lines that go into your home. Those are the lead lines. So what they'll want you to do is run the water for about five minutes, like first thing in the morning instead of waking up and, Getting, getting it going for a cup of water, let it run for a few minutes so that any lead that may have settled in that line goes away. And then they'll send notices out like that to, uh, to uh, help warn people and tell people and educate people about it. So what was your first question again? Bottle water over. Bottle water over drinking water. Well, I don't have a real good answer on that. What I can say is that 
sometimes bottled water is made with plastics that can, what we call, leach into the water, where the water has chemical properties in it that will take the, some, of the, some of the stuff that's in the plastic and actually put it in the water. So is it better for you? Depends on where you're getting your water from. But I can say that both from a, from a, from a eliminating waste standpoint and from the fact that I know City of Columbus does a great job with their water, that it's better to, I think it's better to drink the tap water than it is to drink bottled water. Now you talk to bottled water people, they'll say, no, 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 drink bottled water, please. But tap water is perfectly safe. There you go. Here she goes. So, good question. Who else has got questions? Yo. Um, you said out of the challenge is population pollution and poverty, right? Is mm -hmm. there like one that's more higher than the others or that y'all focus on more? The thing about the what I call the three P's, so if you take anything out of this talk, take the three P's away from you and take that lead as peanut butter, PB. The three P's. It depends because they're all inner intermangled, they're all intertwined. If you have more pollution, you tend to have more poverty. Why is that? Because there's only a certain amount of jobs. I mean, there, there's, only, there's only X number of jobs in a community. And when the population exceeds the number of jobs, you're going to have more poverty, right? Okay? Pollution, the pollution and population are intermingled. We already talked about it. The more people you have, the more lights you got to turn on, the more coal you got to burn, you got more jobs, so you have more factories. And really, poverty and pollution are linked together because the, from a health, from an, from an equity standpoint, um, equity. Oh yeah, sure. So everybody, everybody, regardless of how poor you are, what your race is what your culture is has even has to should be evenly treated the issue is that when you have a lot of factories in a certain area the houses cost less so the houses would cost less in on the south side near Parsons Avenue or near Plaska Light than they will in upper Arlington or Worthington or somewhere like that so when the houses cost less, it tends to drive everything else. And so you, have, you would have people that, don't, that may not be poor, but they're not, they're not you, know, the, you know, the upper 1% of, of the society you know, as far as money goes. So you have poverty tying into pollution as well because where the houses are cheaper, people that are more impoverished are going to want to go. And because because they can afford where the it. Factories are, that that's where that because that, that's where the factories are. Mm -hmm. So so I guess my point is I can't really answer your question because they're all they're all equally important and they all equally play a part in determining health. It's a great question though. Um, you said that the bottled water that um you get like the chemicals from the plastic can go into the water. Can't mm -hmm. you taste the difference? Sometimes you can. And sometimes you can't. It depends on really you. I mean, some people are more sensitive, can, can taste things. Like me, I can taste the chlorine in the water. I can taste it. I can, immediately, I know, there's, I know there's chlorine in the water because I can taste it and I can smell it. Some people don't have that sensitivity to it. Now, there are some things that <clears throat> you can't smell. You can't smell lead. You know, you can't smell some, some pollution that we have out in the community. So can you taste the difference? Maybe sometimes it tastes kind of plasticky, but I, I, I don't know if everyone has the same, can, can be able to taste it like that. But you're getting the problem, you know, not the problem, but you're not getting a large amount. We're talking about dose, right? Dose and how dose weighs into how, how you're going to, that's going to, how it's going to have an impact on you. Well, think about if, when that, if that water does happen to take plastic out, you're not, it's not going to take a lot out. And so are you likely to taste it if it's only taking a little, little bit? Or a lot, I think you would taste that, but not necessarily a little bit. Good. What about with the pipes? How do you keep the pipes from rusting um, for the water to taste 
Well, that's why they use lead and copper, because lead and copper are are rust inhibitors. They 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 are they act sort of like we talk about bleach and how we use it to get rid of bacteria. Well, that's all really rust surrounds around is about essentially bacteria and and metal that what they call oxidizes. So they use lead and copper because it doesn't rust. And so that's how they prevent that. They prevent it through through using the kind of metals that don't have the a tendency to rust like some other metals do. Do they have special cleaning um, cleaning supplies for the metals that they're using? Like if That's a great question, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. A lot of times, good old, you know what elbow grease is? You know what elbow grease is, right? And that's, that's, that's a lot of times how they get rid of a lot of the gunky, nasty stuff that's going to get into those tanks. It's just good old-fashioned scrub brush and elbow grease. And, yeah, they probably do use some chemicals. I would hope, and I don't know this, I'd hope that they would flush those out before they start to reuse those tanks again. So, and a lot of times it's a matter of keeping water moving. If you keep water moving, less likely to have the kind of gunky, gunky stuff build up on it. You guys ever had turkey that's been in the fridge too long? You ever seen that? You ever had that? We'll do it one time. Take a slice of turkey and kind of put it off the side. Don't tell your mom about it. What happened in about a week or two is you'll have like a, a film on it, like a gunky kind of mucusy. You wouldn't want to eat it. Nasty. Well, that kind of same thing happens to pipes. Same thing happens to anywhere where water is. And what it is, it's the bacteria that are building up. They build up on that stuff. And they create what we call a biofilm. That's what this, that's what that gunky stuff is. It's a biofilm. It protects, the, it's like the bacteria's house. It protects the bacteria from you, from, from anything that may hurt it. So that's the kind of stuff I think you're talking about. That's how they clean the, the gunkiness off. It's just good old fashioned scrub. That's fun. Do you guys ever do dishes? I do dishes. Get in there and scrub. I got dishwasher and I still gotta do dishes. That ain't right. Whatever. <laughs> what are you gonna do? What else, guys? I wanna I wanna hear more questions. Yeah. I love talking to people that are smarter than I am. <laughs> I love it. I've, I, I've not seen that. I, I'd be interested to look into that now, I guess, now that you've said that. I, I think it kind of makes sense because what happens is sunlight and all the radiation from the sun, right? We have radiation that comes down. That, that changes everything. It changes water. It changes you. It makes you tan. It makes, if you don't have it, it makes you pale. It'll give you burns. It'll change the chemistry of anything that we, that we had and we talk about. Like, for example, a swimming pool. When there's too much sunlight, and the sunlight's a good thing, don't get me wrong. There's too much sunlight, all the chlorine goes away. All the chlorine just disappears. And so when it's really, really hot, it's really, really important for pools to make sure they're keeping enough chlorine in the water. So I haven't heard, I'm going to look into that, though. I'm going to look into that. That's a good one. What else? Nope. <laughs> okay. How are we doing on time? We got enough time? We're good. We're good. We're going to take another, another question. One more. Go ahead. How do you guys deal with acid rain? Acid rain. Wow. That's another great question. Well, what is acid rain? So how, do, so how do we deal with acid rain? Well, unfortunately, when it turns into acid rain, it's too late. It's already, it's already acid. It's already acid rain. So there's an, it's very old school, and it's not the way we think now, but it still has some bearing on today. And the thing is, 
The solution to pollution is dilution. What do I mean by that? What's dilution? <laughs> so if I take a drop of chlor oh man, I got the wrong word. If I have a big swimming pool and I put one drop of chlorine in it, what do you how much chlorine you think is gonna be if this thing is this deep, how much how much do you think that chlorine is gonna impact that water? Uh, Not at all, right? If I take a whole gallon of it and dump it in, that's dilution. How much you're putting in versus how much is already there. Like I said, it doesn't make it right. But that's why people are allowed to pollute the air. Because the air tends to take care, it can, it can sort of take care of itself just by how much air there is. And Mother Nature has very unique ways to help cleanse herself um, of the things we do. Um, so from a water pollution standpoint, it's the same thing. Um, the, you, you can st and that's where acid rain kind of helps build into this process, is if acid rain does get in the water, how much of that rain is going to affect a lake or a river that has millions of gallons of water running through it? I mean, it'd have to, would it surprise me, would it surprise you if I told you that sometimes acid gets spilled directly into, into rivers, directly into streams? There was a, there was a truck accident um, no more than three weeks ago where a whole tanker truck was let go into a stream or a creek. Mother Nature can, has a tendency to be able to take care of herself. And before that water ever gets drunk, it's going to go through a process where all that stuff gets removed. So does it make it right? No. It doesn't make it right. But again, Mother Nature has a tendency to be able to help take care of herself too. We're not helping, but you know, she can, she does a pretty good job. That's great. That's another great question. Because we don't, I guess the answer, I guess I need to answer your question. We don't necessarily do anything directly with acid rain. Um, I think acid, as, as, as we move towards using gas instead of coal, because acid rain is really related to factories, but really it's about coal-fired power plants a lot and car use. Those are the two, those two pollutants is what, what makes that up and what makes acid rain up. We don't do a whole lot with it. We try to encourage people to walk more instead of drive, do things like that to help reduce pollution to that end. And as we move towards using natural gas instead of electricity to power things, it'll, it'll help kind of keep that down and reduce it. It's a great question. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Um, uh, we're going to start meeting a little earlier, all right, throughout the month.